I hope we have a moment before we close to just worship him for another moment or two. But I'm going to get into the teaching. And if we have time, we're going to just worship him a few more moments as well at the end. But um, I want to ask you to turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12, Hebrews chapter 12. And we'll start there in verse number two. And I want to pick up where I left off because I want to promise you something from God's word, what God promises, and that is that you're not going to miss God's will for your life. You're not going to miss God's will for your life. And I began to talk about this last Sunday and I want to pick it up here today. And I want you to know that you're not going to miss God's will for your life, you know, frankly, because you really didn't start God's will for your life. Jesus started it. And that's why the Bible says here in verse two of Hebrews 12, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. Sometimes we think we started it and sometimes we think we got to finish it. But the good news is we don't we don't have to play either of those parts because we already have an author. He's the writer of your story. He's the author of your bestseller. He's the he's the originator, creator of your life and his will for your life. He started it. He's the author and he's going to finish it. He's the finisher. He's the author and the finisher. I think one translation says he's the architect and he's the builder. In other words, he designs it and he also builds it. He designs it and he builds it. He's the architect and the builder. Sometimes the architects and the builders, they argue. They're like, well, that's not quite what I had in mind. The builders like, well, this is what I had in mind. You can't do this on the top of a roof. You might have designed it that way, smarty pants, but you can't finish it that way. But see, we don't have that problem with God because he's the architect and he's the builder. He's the author and the finisher. Man, wherever you are right now, just say amen. And I'm going to I'm telling you something good's going to happen in your life. He is Jesus is the one who started this good work in you and he will finish it. Until the day of his return, everything's going to be all right. You're not going to miss it. There's so many people afraid if they don't click on to the right Instagram account, the right Facebook page, the right tweet, the right Twitter, the the right tweet, the right media outlet that somehow they're going to miss God's will. And you're not going to miss God's will because God's will is not manifest in the evening news or in Twitter or in the media. God's will is manifest in Jesus Christ and him alone. And what are we doing? We're looking unto Jesus. This verse says this is how we can be sure that we don't miss the will of God. You know why you're not going to miss the beautiful will of God for your life? It's because you have your eyes on the right thing. You're focused on the right thing. A lot of people are focused on the wrong things. They're focused on what people have done to them. They're focused on their pain. They're focused on what they're lacking. They're focused on what they're missing. But see, we don't have to be focused on those things. We need to be focused on Jesus. And we need to be thinking about him and return, as the Bible says in Revelation to return to our first love. When Jesus was the one who started this walk with God in your life. Let's return to him. Let's return our attention. It's not like we we're away from him, but our minds. That's where the battle is won in our thought life, in our in our minds. Let's return to him in our minds. Let's return to him in our thinking. Let's return to him where he's the center of our lives and he's the center of our of our thoughts and he's the focus. What he's done for us is the focus of our lives and gets the focus of our attention. This is why I've spent several weeks talking about the beauty of Jesus, because so many people have a distorted view of him. Satan's number one weapon in this world is to distort the view or the image that you have of God, to distort your concept of Jesus so that you have a a wrong understanding about him. Because if you think he's angry and mean and mad and 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 hurtful and harmful and and that he's going to just zap you whenever you get out of line, then you'll never want to focus on him. You'll never want to come to him. You'll never want to draw near to him because you've been given a distorted version of him. And God wants us to erase the distortions and erase the vandalism that has been on Jesus beauty and see him for what he really is. I believe that real Christianity is this. 
if you could catch one glimpse of how beautiful that Jesus truly is, if you could catch one glimpse of how beautiful Jesus truly is, you would forsake everything to follow him. If you could catch one glimpse of how beautiful that he really is. I think religion has distorted the picture we have of Jesus. Some some broken man that doesn't know how to lead, doesn't know what's really happening in your life, doesn't really understand or he's mad or angry. And we don't find a Jesus like that in the Bible. So why do preachers preach about that? Why are they distorting this beautiful savior? And you might think, well, why do you keep talking about that? Because I really want it to penetrate because so many years, decades, centuries have gone by. And Jesus has been painted in a wrong light and God has been painted. See, even even now, many people think God sent this virus. God sent these problems to teach you a lesson. While God can teach you a lesson in the midst of any problem, he certainly doesn't send anything bad in our lives. He doesn't have anything bad to send us. You have to have something bad to send somebody something bad. God would have to have some sickness to send you sickness, but he took away our sickness on the cross and by his stripes were healed. The devil in this world are trying to distort the image of Jesus, trying to paint a wrong picture of him, trying to vandalize and assassinate the goodness of God. There is an all out assault and an assassination attempt at the goodness of God. To get people to question whether God really has a good plan for their life, and he really does. He said, my plans for you are for good and not for evil. In Jeremiah 29, verse 11, to give you a future, to give you a hope. Have you felt hopeless? Focus on Jesus today. Have you felt like your the future doesn't look bright? Focus on Jesus today. He has a plan for you for good and not for evil to give you. A future, you see, your future is a gift from God and to give you hope, your hope is a gift from God. It's going to be all right. You're not going to miss it. Well, what if I'm not, you know, in the right place at the right time? God knows your address. God knows how to get to you. God knows how to get through to you. He knows what's missing in your life. He knows how to fix it. He knows how to solve it. He knows everything about you. He knew you before you were formed in your mother's womb, the Bible says, and he called you. He chose you before the foundation of the world. You see, this is why you're not going to miss it. Because number one, you're focused on the right thing, Jesus. Our focus doesn't need to be on religion. It needs to be on a person. Christianity is not a religion. It's a relationship with a person. It's a relationship with God. It's a relationship with Jesus, your beautiful savior. It says fixing our eyes, Hebrews 12, verse two, fixing our eyes on him. You see, that's something we have to make a decision to do. What are we going to focus on? What are we going to fix ourselves on? What are we going to look unto? One translation says fixing your eyes on Jesus. One translation says looking unto Jesus. See, we're all looking at something. We're all focused on something. We're all zeroing in and giving our attention to something. Let's give our attention and give our focus to Jesus. Because he is the author and he is the finisher of our faith. He's going to finish what he started in your life. You're not going to miss it. That starts with focusing on the right thing, the person of Jesus. Look at what the Bible says about him in Psalm 45, verse two and verse three. Let's look a little closer at Jesus again today. You are the most handsome of men. The Bible says about Jesus, you are the most handsome of men. Grace flows from your lips. Therefore, God has blessed you forever. Mighty warrior, strap your sword at your side in your majesty and in your splendor, in your splendor, ride triumphantly in the cause of truth 
humility and justice. That's who Jesus is. Look at what it says again in verse two. You are the most handsome of men. Grace flows from your lips. Then he says in verse three, a mighty warrior strapping your sword at your side in your majesty and in your splendor, in your splendor, you'll ride triumphantly. Guess what? Nothing can stand in the way of Jesus plan for your life. Nothing can stand in the way of Jesus triumphant victory in your life. For he is the cause, he said he rides triumphantly in the cause of truth. You know, people can lie and people can try to cover up the truth, but the truth crushed to earth, it will rise again. You cannot keep the truth from rising again. His cause is truth, humility. He's not arrogant. Our savior, this beautiful Jesus, he's the most beautiful person in the universe, the most beautiful being in the universe. And he's so humble. Remember how beautiful is his humility, how beautiful is his humility that when the father had transferred all power in the earth into Jesus hands. And as he talks about in John chapter 13, when all power was given into his hands, Jesus didn't take a seat. Jesus didn't take a throne. Jesus didn't take a victory lap. Jesus didn't take a victory march. Jesus took a basin of water and a towel and he got on his knees and he washed his disciples feet. Because his cause is truth and humility and justice, the most beautiful savior. And where do we find him washing his disciples feet with his own hands? His own towel wrapped around his waist, takes the towel off in John 13. I think it is. You can find it there later, perhaps. How beautiful is his humility? How beautiful is this savior in Revelation chapter one? I don't want us to move on from this yet. I feel like God really wants to stun us. He wants to engage us. He wants to blow our minds with the beauty of Jesus and how beautiful he really is, because all beauty comes from him. God created all things that are beautiful. God created. And guess what he's working on in your life? He's working on the things that are happening in your life right now, because it says in Ecclesiastes 311, he makes all things beautiful in its time. He makes everything beautiful in its time. You'll see this in the new King James version of this verse or the King James version. He has made everything beautiful in its time, in its time. Now, I know you're going to start thinking, man, is this last Sunday's message? Are you guys just replaying last Sunday? I know it sounds familiar because. Frankly, God hasn't. Told me to move on to something to some other topic, so I'm staying right here. I'm camping right here for a while because I'm believing God for a revival in your life, a revival in your home, a revival in our city, a revival in our nation. I'm believing for thousands and millions of people to come to Jesus in the next several weeks, months and years. I'm believing that there will be a revival of Christianity, not religion, not legalism, not rituals and rules and condescending towards anybody else or self-righteousness. But I mean, true liberty, true freedom that comes from the truth of Jesus Christ. It says his cause back in that verse I shared with you earlier in Psalm 45, his cause is. Truth. Humility. And justice. God's going to right every wrong in your life. Whatever's been wrong, he's going to make it right. Whatever has been unfairly dealt to you, God's going to deal you into his hand and he's going to make it better. That's why we need to fix our eyes on the one who is the author and the finisher of our faith. That's why. You're not going to miss God's beautiful will for your life. In Revelation, chapter one, verse 13, one like a son of man, he describes Jesus 
in this passage of scripture. One like the son of man clothed in a robe, long robe with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze refined in a furnace and his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held the seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two edged sword and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. That's the Jesus of the Bible. In Psalm 27, verse four in the Message Bible, you remember what we talked about weeks ago? He said this one thing I'm going to ask, David said, just this one thing that I'm going to ask to live with him in his house my whole life long. I'll contemplate his beauty. And I'll study at his feet. When you discover the beauty of Jesus, it brings you to his feet where you want to learn of him and study and receive from him and listen to him and worship him. You see. Beauty brings people to Jesus. Beauty really is one of God's greatest evangelists. Is by seeing all of creation, seeing the playfulness of creation, seeing the beauty of a sunset, the beauty of the Grand Canyon, the beauty of mountains and hills, the beauty of valleys and the beauty of I saw an incredible picture of from the Hubble telescope that took a picture of Saturn. I don't know, it was just a few days ago, but it was from 450. I think it was 450 million miles away and it was just picture perfect. Like you could not man could not create something this perfect, the perfect roundness, the ring around the planet itself. It's just an incredible depiction of God's art, God's beauty. Man could not make man could only observe that. And what does it do? It causes man to realize. There's a cre there's a creator to all of this. Beauty can't come out of dis out of. An explosion. Can't get a can't have an explosion in a printing shop and out of all of that explosion, all the pieces fall in place to create a dictionary. There's no way that an explosion in a printing shop could create a dictionary. There's no way that the beauty that is in this world could come. By accident. It was made by God to point to God and to give you something to enjoy, because God wants us to enjoy our lives, even in a pandemic, even in a crisis, because there'll be another one. Who knows what will happen at the end of this year? Who knows what will happen next year? Who knows what will happen in five years? God wants us to learn how to celebrate and enjoy him all the days of our life. You're not going to miss him. You're not going to miss him. You're not going to miss. God's will for your life, you're not going to miss it. You're not going to miss it while everybody else is making it. You're not going to miss it. God's got you in the palm of his hand. In the Song of Solomon, chapter two, verse one. The Bible says that the king says, and this is really a foreshadowing of Jesus. He says, I am the rose of Sharon. The, the lily of the valley, Song of Solomon, chapter two, verse one. I'm the rose of Sharon, the lily of the valleys. You know, Jesus simply Jesus isn't simply a rose. He's the rose of Sharon. And if you study this out, you can take a rose of Sharon and you can pull it leaf from leaf and you can place the leaves in a jar and you will find that each leaf retains its fragrance in the jar. Each leaf retains its fragrance. It's what makes that particular rose so special. And it's a picture of Jesus. When you get a glimpse of him. His beauty is always retained. 
once you catch a glimpse. It's in your memory forever. Once. He's forgiven you of all your sin and once once you really believe that he did that 2000 years ago, but once you really believe that he forgave me. It's in my memory. The fragrance of his forgiveness. Is something I'll never lose the fragrance of his love, the fragrance of his kindness, the fragrance of his character. It never dies. It never dies. Jesus Christ satisfies the highest, greatest taste of the most educated person. No one can want anything more once they taste him. Jesus is the glory of God. He is the beauty among us. Jesus tells us stories of a father throwing parties at the return of lost sons of a master hosting a banquet and says you're invited. In Isaiah, he says he will give you beauty for your ashes. God is the most beautiful being in all reality can be seen in his self emptying love. Reuniting us back to the source of all that is good and all that is true and all that is beautiful to reunite us through his own sacrifice. He reunites us to him, the source of all love and the source of all beauty. Jesus is the center of the Bible. Remember. There is no Bible without Jesus. There is no Christianity without Jesus. There is no salvation without Jesus. There is no heaven without Jesus. It's certainly not one that I'd want to be at. From Genesis to Revelation in every book, there is Jesus. No wonder when you read the Bible. You'll see Jesus everywhere if you look for him. You're not going to miss. You're not going to miss it. He's too good. He's too beautiful. He's too caring. You won't miss it because number one, you're focused on the right thing. Jesus, you won't miss it because number two. He began the work inside of you and he will complete it. Philippians chapter one, verse six. Notice what Paul said to the Philippians. He said, I'm confident of this very thing that he who began a good work in you, he will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. So how can we be delivered from this fear of missing God, this fear of missing his will, this fear that we're going to be left out? Let me tell you something. The fear goes away when you realize that he was the one that began the good work in you and he's going to finish it. He's going to complete it. He's going to perfect it until the day of his return. Faithful is he. Faithful is he. Why aren't you not going to miss? Why are you not going to miss it? Why are you not going to miss your moment? Why are you not going to miss God's will? Why are you not going to miss God's destiny for your life? Because he's faithful, because he's the faithful one who began a good work in you. Faithful is he who began a good work in you and he will finish it. It's another scripture in First Thessalonians chapter five, I think he says that. In verse 18, faithful is he who began it in you and he will complete it. The faithful one, the faithful one, the faithful one. You see, the Bible says even when we're faithless. He remains faithful. You're not going to find God's will because of your faithfulness. You're going to walk in his will because of his faithfulness. He's going to make sure that you make it to the end, to the finish line. You're not going to miss it. A third reason you're not going to miss it. Because he's the one who's been looking for you. He's the one who's been looking for you. Do you realize? It wasn't us that decided we're going to seek God. It was him looking for us while we were searching in Jeremiah, chapter 31, verse one. He found us. We were looking for him. We were looking for something, but he found us in Jeremiah 31, verse one. I want to read this to you from the Message Bible. At that time, declares the Lord, I will be the God of all 
the families of Israel and they shall be my people, he says. This is the way God put it. They found grace in the wilderness. This is the way God put it. They found grace out in the desert, in the wilderness. These people who survived the killing Israel, verse three, Israel out looking for a place to rest, met God out looking for them. Every one of us are looking for that place of rest. We think sometimes rest will come when we have the right job, when we have the right relationship, when we have the right day off, when we have peace in our world. There's always going to be something in this world that's negative. There's always going to be something in this world that's bad. There is a devil and there's people that make bad decisions and bad choices. But the Bible says, while the people of God were looking for a place to rest. They met God who was actually looking for them. No matter what you're looking for right now, God's been looking for you. God told them, I've never quit loving you and I never will expect love, love and more love. You see, he's the one that's out looking for you. You're not going to miss it because God's the one who's done the searching to find you. God's the one who's been looking for you to bestow his goodness on, to pour his love on, to awaken your gifts and your calling and your purpose within you. He's been looking for you to do you good all the days of your life. When you start realizing that he never stopped loving you and he never will, he said, I've never quit loving you and I never will. Then guess what's going to happen when you believe that about God? It's going to set your expectation on the right thing. Expect love, love and more love, it says. And then he says, what will happen when you start expecting love? What will happen when you start expecting God to come through for you, expecting God to answer, expecting uh, the wisdom to show up, the answers to show up, the solutions to show up, expect God to turn it around, expect God to take your ashes and turn them into beauty, expect him, expect, 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 because that's what love does. Love always comes through. Love always turns it around. Love always shows up. Love always makes it better. And God is love. And he's always going to show up in your life. And he's always going to turn it around in your life. And he's always going to make it better in your life. So wake up every day expecting good, expecting kindness, expecting love, expecting mercy, expecting his miracles, expecting his power in your life. Because when you start expecting the good. Look at what he says will happen. He says, I'll start over with you and I'll build you up. He says you'll resume your singing. He says you'll start singing like you've never sung before. He says you'll start dancing. He said you'll grab tambourines and you'll join the dance. You'll go back to your old work of planting vineyards on the hillsides of Samaria and you'll sit back and enjoy the fruit. Get ready. For a season of sitting back. And enjoying the fruit. That's what happens when you put your trust in Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. You'll sit back. And you'll enjoy the fruit. You'll enjoy the harvests. It's your time. You're not going to miss it. You're going to sit back. And you're going to enjoy. The next season of your life. Stop expecting the next season to be hard. Stop expecting the next season to be destructive. Stop expecting the next season to get worse. Why does it have to get worse? Why can't it get better with God? Everything gets better. He takes us from the old covenant to the new covenant. He takes us from the curse to the blessing. Look at how he does things. He takes us from empty to being filled. He takes us from lost to being found. He takes us from sickness to healing. He takes us from bondage to freedom. He takes us from darkness and night to morning and to light. The way God does things, we should start expecting our lives to get better. You're not going to miss it. You're not going to miss it because you're focused on the right thing, Jesus. 
the author and finisher of your faith. You're not going to miss it because, frankly, he began a good work and you will finish it until the day of his return. He's faithful. You're not going to miss it because God's faithful. You're not going to miss it because he's been out looking for you. He's gone before you. He's gone ahead of you. The Bible says the presence of God. Will go before you and you will find rest. You see, God's already been to your tomorrow to make a way for you. God's already been to your next week to prepare it for you. He's already been to your next year. He's already been to your next decade. And he's gone ahead of you. So walk into tomorrow with joy, walk into tomorrow with confidence, walk into tomorrow with expectation that God has already gone before me and made a way. Yes, for you, you're not going to miss it. You know why else you're not going to miss it? You're not going to miss it because you've discovered. The beauty of sitting at Jesus feet like Mary in Luke, chapter 10, verse 41. The Lord answered and said to Martha, who was complaining about Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus while Martha had to do all the work. And the Lord answered and said, Martha, you're worried and bothered about so many things, but only one thing is necessary. And Mary has chosen the good. And it's not going to be taken away from her. Notice what he says there. Mary has chosen the good and it's not going to be taken away from her. Choose the good. I've been saying through the last four or five months, through all of this that we've been in, whenever it started. Look for the good, look for the good, look for the good. There's a silver lining in every storm. Look for the good. Look for the good. Mary chose the good. She chose to sit at the feet of Jesus. Why? Because you've learned the beauty of sitting at the feet of Jesus, right? When we're sitting at his feet, that's where rest truly comes from. Sitting at his feet, we find rest. Sitting at his feet, we find wisdom. Sitting at his feet, we find his love. Sitting at his feet, we find healing. Sitting at his feet, we find answers. Sitting at his feet, we find peace. Sitting at his feet, we find deliverance. What how do we sit at his feet? That's what you're doing right now. By listening to his word, you're sitting at his feet. When we worship him, we're sitting at his feet. When we listen to his voice, we're sitting at his feet. When we gather together and connect in our church family. We're sitting at Jesus feet. You're not going to miss it. You're not going to miss it. You won't miss it. Because. You're being transformed. God is transforming you through the renewing of your mind. If you look at the scripture in Romans, chapter 12, verse two, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That you may prove what is the will of God, the good, the acceptable and the perfect. And I want you to see the progress here, because transformation is a process. And walking in God's will, fulfilling God's will for your life. It's progressive, he says, as you renew your mind, as you. Adopt your thinking to line up with God's thinking, to line up with what Jesus already did for you, to line up with his promises, to line up with his grace, to line up with his love, get our thoughts in agreement with God's thoughts about himself and about you. He loves you. He's for you. Then what happens is, is as your mind is renewed, you see, when we're born again, our spirit is born again, but our mind, our soul needs to be renewed. It's transformed by the renewing of our mind, by fasting from wrong thinking, as you've heard me talk about for years. And as you replace that negative thinking with God's way of thinking, notice what he says happens, you prove or you walk in or you are experiencing the will of God, the good, the acceptable and the perfect. So it's progressive. It's good. And then it becomes acceptable, which is well pleasing to God and perfect, which is complete. It doesn't mean perfect and without error. It, it, 
although God is perfect without error. But the word perfect here is teleos in Greek, and it literally means to finish, to finish. In other words, as you renew your mind to God's word, the will of God is going to manifest in your life. You're going to see the good will of God. You're going to see the acceptable, well-pleasing will of God. And then you're going to see the finished will of God. You're going to finish the race. You're going to finish the journey. You're going to make it to the end. You're going to experience God's perfect ending of your life story. It might not have started real good or you might have had some really bad chapters like I have had in my life. All of our stories have some bad chapters in them. But your story doesn't end in the bad chapters. It ends here in the good, the acceptable and the perfect will of God. And finally, you're not going to miss it because you're learning how to be thankful for what you already have. In First Thessalonians, chapter five, verse seven, I believe it says, for this is the will of God. Verse 18, right in that passage of scripture there, for this is the will of God to give thanks in everything. In everything, give thanks. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. You know, every one of us can make a choice today. We make a choice to be negative about what others have done to us and what we don't have and what we've suffered through and what we have struggled with. Or we can make a choice to give thanks. No matter what's going on in this world, what God has done for us is so much greater than whatever anybody has done to us. That this attitude of gratefulness, gratitude and thanks. This is how to be sure that you never miss God's best for your life in gratitude and thanks for what God has already done, for what Jesus has already done for you, for what's done for you in Christ Jesus. Give thanks for his death, his resurrection. Give thanks for his healing. Give thanks for his love. Give thanks for his promises. Begin to give thanks for what's already yours. It'll get you to focus on what's already yours what God has already done rather than what you're missing or what you don't have in your life. You're not going to miss it because you've got your eyes on what Jesus has already done for you rather than having your eyes on what's missing or what you don't have in your life. Today is your day. To step fully in to God's plan for your life. How do we start? We start by being born again. I want to pray with you if you've never accepted Jesus Christ into your life as your savior and Lord. Pray this out loud with me and everybody pray this with us. Just pray that with me out loud as you accepting if you're accepting Jesus Christ in your life as your Lord and savior, just say, Heavenly Father, that's it. Heavenly Father, I invite Jesus Christ into my life as my savior and Lord. I believe Jesus died for my sins and rose from the dead. I'm stepping in to your plan for my life beginning today. In Jesus name, if you prayed that prayer, all of heaven is rejoicing. The Bible says all of heaven rejoices when one person is saved. So we want to rejoice with you. Let us know if you prayed that prayer. Let me know. I want to send you a gift to help you grow in your this new journey, this new walk with God and for everybody. Who's connected here, stay connected. Let's continue to have our minds renewed. Let's continue to be transformed. Let's continue to connect in the love of God as a spiritual family, as a church family. And let's trust God. And let's believe that God is making a way for us, even when it seems like there is no way. You're not going to miss it. You're not going to miss God's will, his good will, his acceptable will and his perfect will of God. You're going to see it manifest day by day in your life. Stay connected. Come on, let's worship him for a moment before we close. From rising sun till kingdom come, your faithful love is unfailing. Though shadows turn 
in tempest still you oh god are unchanging through every bless you in Jesus name. I bless your house. I bless your home. I bless your family. I bless your job. I bless your your health, your body, your mind, your soul. I bless everyone and everything in your life in Jesus name. It's blessed coming in, blessed going out. I can't wait to worship with you on Wednesday. We'll see you then and daily bread on Monday. God bless. I love you guys. Have a beautiful rest of your day.